Welcome to Larry the Alchemist, where we discuss all things heavy metal and hard rock. And for this episode, I have a special guest with me as we are going to be listing our 10 favorite Richie Blackmore moments. That includes riffs, licks, deep purple, rainbow, whatever. Uh, and let me introduce my guest here first. Joining me is uh, Jonathan. Jonathan is, uh, has the Maiden A to Z podcast. He also has a brand new Megadeth podcast called So Far, So Pod, So What? All right. Well, you can also awesome. search for Megadeth podcast. I made it easy like that, you know. Awesome. All right. Well, Jonathan is no stranger to the lair. He was here uh, with his Maiden A to Z podcast buddy, and we did a Dream Iron Maiden set list. And uh, we just connected on Facebook, literally like, 30 minutes ago and we right were, because you had a break right you didn't uh, you weren't on facebook for, for a bit right right i was I off facebook it. for a little yeah. while he sent me a friend request sent me a facebook message about 30 minutes ago we were like hey thanks for thanks for doing the the made in setless episode all of a sudden we started talking we both realized that richie blackmore is our favorite guitar player we both said what are you doing right now we said nothing let's do a list of our 10 favorite richie blackmore moments so we're flying spitting yeah. off the top of our domes here we're, we're 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 just improvising it but we're such big blackmore fans we knew we could pull this off uh so jonathan what uh, why is richie blackmore your favorite guitar player Ooh, i've been onto this in, in both podcasts actually already you know even though the megadeth one is new you know uh, i'm a guitarist but i tend to follow drummers mostly it's more inspiring to me but some guitarists are so good that they're very inspiring anyway and uh, the reason for Rich is to be number one, that's something we had in common, would be that he's sort of uh, always a little bit off bounds, you know, it's never really that controlled or contrived. So there's a lot of fire, a lot of uh, life in his playing, and maybe never the same two times. I like that, you know, it's yeah. part of the old rock tradition that I personally prefer more than you know, take a super talented modern metal guitarist like uh, Tosin Abasi. Uh, maybe not my kind of band, but I can hear that he's great. But it's a little bit too controlled for my taste. You know, Richie is always on the way to kind of almost lose it. Yeah, and that's what I like. You know, it stays exciting. So uh, I'm curious to know why you dig this guy. Uh, yeah, I think because Richie sort of em embodies all the things that I like in guitar players. I like guitar players that uh, have some technique. So Richie has that. But what I like about Richie is, is that he's very controlled. He just doesn't play fast all the time. He can play super slow and super melodic. I like guys that also break out of the standard pentatonics so that we're talking guitar here, pentatonic blues box. Right. Because I like blues based guitar players. There's, there's a lot of those guys that I do really like. I always like because I'm also a big Randy Rhodes fan. And I mm, love the great. way Randy incorporated sort of the more classical type of scales and classical sounds. So Richie is sort of the godfather of that. He's been doing that from very early on. He's able to, you know, I, I just got uh, Rainbow on stage on vinyl. Some For some crazy reason, I, I didn't have that in my collection. I came across it and I was listening to it. I hadn't listened to it in a while, so I was listening to it. And I was struck by how well Richie can move between all these worlds. He can play this sort of classical Bach type thing. He can play very, very convincing. He's an amazing blues player. Oh, yeah. Uh, also, one thing I really admire about Richie is, is that he can play very, very subtle. If you listen to that Rainbow on Stage album, Catch the rainbow on that one. Catch the rainbow. Like even before he uh, the song starts, he's playing like some little classical things and he's playing whisper quiet at times. Yes. He's just yeah. whisper quiet. And that whole song, Catch the Rainbow, is a great example. In the verses, it is so subtle and subdued. And he's playing so gentle. And so, and then at the end of the song, he's just tearing it up it's so much dynamics in Richie's playing and you almost never see anybody do that think about modern guitar players when they when they go to solo you know a solo spotlight at the show it's just you know 10 their volume is on 10 their speed is on 10 
Richie can sit there, turn, play clean, play some super quiet, picked melodic thing. He can play the really Marshall ready to explode thing. He can do the Jimi Hendrix whammy bar, crazy noise type of stuff. And also the way he's able to, uh, the way he improvises and the way it's uh, off the cuff, you know. So much, so yeah. much of it is really, right? Right. And sometimes he misses the mark, you know, sometimes it's it has part to of the be... excitement though, you know, exactly, if you never miss, exactly. you're not adventurous in my opinion, you know. Yeah, before we, uh, when we were texting back and forth, uh, we were mentioning some of our other favorite guitar players and you mentioned Uli Roth. And I, I saw Uli on, uh, he was on this uh, cruise called 70,000 Tons of Metal. I'm familiar, know. actually. I think I've got friends that played on this boat. Swedish. And the very first yeah. one that they did, uh, Uli was on it. And I got to, he played very late one night in a uh, lounge like area, very small thing. And I was sitting literally five feet away from him, listening to him play ground level. There was no stage. He was standing like five feet right. from me and I sure. got to listen to him, right? So then uh, there, was, there was like nobody there for his show that night. But then on the last day of the cruise, he was on the big stage on the deck of the boat. So it's, you know, out, outside, outdoors there on the boat, top, top deck. And all the bands were there. All the other bands were there. You saw all of them all standing together. I like out of respect, like, you know, this right. is really Roth here. And uh, Testament was on the boat and Testament did, uh, a cover of Sales of Sharon on one of their albums. I don't remember where. And the, they had uh, the singer, uh, Chuck Billy, right? That's the singer? Chuck Billy, yeah, with yeah. the miniature uh, mic stand. That he right, right. Him. He got up yeah. on stage to sing it, and he got up, and Uli, uh, this is leading to what we're, this relates back to Blackmore. He, he got up, uh, Uli got up to the microphone, and he went, yeah, this isn't planned. We just decided to do this. We're just going to jam. This is the way we did things in the 70s. We just jammed. And it made me think of Richie Blackmore, Deep Purple back then. They, and, and I'm going to hold off part of this to remember that I mentioned this because I'm going to talk right about this with my first pick uh, for Blackmore. But he, Richie's just off the cuff. And if you listen to live Deep Purple, if it, especially with Deep Purple, the dynamic between him and John Lord was just like they never played anything the same way twice. Right. You know, and, and another thing I admired about Richie was is that, you know, Richie is known to have he's this guy with a big ego and everything. But when you listen to him live, like with Deep Purple and even with Rainbow, but especially with Deep Purple, when John Lord was soloing, Richie goes way in the back, like he, he back. drops back, almost like a jazz guy. When yes. jazz guys, so when a sax player is soloing, everybody else drops back and gives us, and Richie could do that. He would just drop back and play some really simple thing behind John while, while John Lord was soloing. And I always admired that about Richie, that he didn't, that he could step back and let somebody else take the spot. He didn't have to always be like, you know, pounding away and everything. Like when John Lord would solo, it was like, okay, John, it's your time. And he would drop back and let John do his thing. And so I just admire like pretty much everything about, about Richie Blackmore. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I've got a few associations right off the cuff there that will lead into what we talk about. One of them was that I said that my favorite thing is that he's sort of out of control. And yeah. then you add your favorite thing is that he's in control. And really both are true. And that's also yeah. part of what's brilliant, you know, and, and you addressed him stepping back. He's going to do single string rhythms behind Lord no more. Yeah very lightly you know i have one in, in a coming example uh, where that's pretty much you know or very much the case and then also i have to mention that neoclassical thing because you mentioned Rhodes and you mentioned uh, roth and uh, you know i'm from stockholm uh, we have in mountain of course from the other side of the town uh, and he gets a lot of credit for, for that but i feel like uli john roth and uh, and uh, blackmore they they were early with this neoclassical approach yeah, and uh, also true. with the i mean ingve actually has a pretty rooted sound uh, but uh, even more so you know blackmore the sound never really is crutches for him it's not like tons of delay or right, effects right, right, or anything right. it's all fingers it's all attitude and that makes yeah. it i think even if you're not a guitar nerd you can hear that it's more urgent 
or something. You know, urgency, I guess, would be a word I use to describe this guy. And Richie, uh, the difference between Ingve and Richie is this Ingve pretty much stripped, at least early on, took all the blues out of his his playing. He was just one. When you listen to Ingve Malmsteen's Rising Force, you know it's one hundred percent neoclassical. But Richie is able to play both those things very, very convincingly. He's an excellent, excellent blues player, yeah. as well as a guy that can burn up and down, play those arpeggios and neoclassical type of runs and stuff like that. And as for as much as I like Ingve, I always felt like, man, why can't he just slow down? Why can't he pick his spots better the way Blackmore does? You know, more Blackmore. is more. How can yeah. less be more? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's a classic by now. <laughs> right. And it's it's funny because, you know, Ingve says he's not influenced by Blackmore, but everybody knows that he is. Ah, poor shit. Yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous, you know, and everybody knows that he is. And even, you know, when Ingve early on dressed like him and, and everything. Moved but, like him too. He tried yeah, to make exactly. Him move, you know? But he missed that one very crucial lesson, you know, that, that, just dynamics basically dynamics yeah and being able to being able to play a lot play a little you know that that interplay and i think is i mean gosh by the time richie was even in rainbow i think he was past the whole like i gotta play fast to prove myself there's a video of him with the concerto the deep purple concerto thing where he's playing that what is that a gibson the red Thing oh yeah the e, 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 es335 or something yeah 335, i think yeah and there's a spot in that where the orchestra stops and it's just drums and richie and he's ripping like this just insane like solo and i mean we're talking that concerto came out in 70 but i think this recording is 69 it's like man nobody was playing as fast as that in, in it's incredible what he was doing in like 68 69 you know, listen to what he was doing with Deep Purple at, at that time. And he was so far ahead of everybody else, like technique wise. But by the time you get to even just Machine Head, you know, he's already kind of like, oh, OK, I don't need to be play fast all the time. I can you know, um, it's more about being melodic and ideas and stuff like that. So I always see Richie's way ahead of his time. I think he he doesn't get the credit he deserves. I, maybe part of it is because he doesn't kind of he doesn't toot his own horn, sort of, you know what I mean? Like he's, he's, he, he's being he avoids difficult, the you know? press and everything like right. that. He, he, he doesn't do that, that kind of, he's, he's kind of standoffish with, with the press and everything. He has this, you know, and that's part of his persona is this the man in black. He's moody. He's right. Right. You know, real, yeah. you know, that, that kind of, can, that kind of thing. So maybe that's two good friends uh, over in, in your country in, um, in Providence, Rhode Island, and in and somewhere in Illinois, and they do the Deep Purple podcast, and, uh, and like a reoccurring phrase is "Richie refused." <laughs> something you know, he always refused. You know, he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't play along, basically, yeah. which is funny because he totally plays along, like you said, with the bands. I worked for some years in a blues jazz bar, one of the better here in Stockholm, and then I figured how hard it is to play like that and to play you know with dynamics and to to jam with a band and i miss that in a lot of modern metal because i work with those bands too and it's a little bit too much everything on all the time yeah quite often so th that's why I, you know we, everyone leans back I, even the kids i talk to that are born around the millennia it's like yeah black blackmore you know because uh, unmatched in many ways still yeah all right, well, let's uh, let's jump into it then. These are our 10 favorite Richie Blackmore moments. So that can, can include a solo, a lick, a, a main riff, uh, Deep Purple, Rainbow, everything's fair game. So what do you got for your number 10? Uh, these are not going to come in order of excellence or anything. So they're coming right, in order. Right, same for me. We're just sort of... Yeah, yeah. We're just sort of and the uh, first one will be a Burn, the main riff of Burn. Uh, because to me it's like a continuation of smoke on the water and richie said like in his typical manner around that with smoke on the water that he had heard things like kinks you really got me you know easy riffs and he said you know it seemed to generate a lot of fame and a lot of cash and i wanted in on that 
<laughs> you know, writing smoke on the water. And I feel like burn is taking pretty much a similar approach to uh, at least in terms of tonality, but making it more rad. It's a very, you know, that's the best word I have for the riff. It's very rad. And, and the song keeps starting and stopping, but it's never annoying. Every time it's just like, you know, brings you right back home to that riff, which is the cornerstone, I think, of the song and definitely deserves a, a mention in, in this list. Great, great pick. Okay, my number 10, again, these are in no particular order, but I had to do this one first from Fireball, No, No, No. And the reason why I picked this one is because it was the first time I saw Richie. It might have been the first time I even heard. I mean, I had heard Smoke on the Water, on the radio and stuff like that. But the first time I saw Richie was for, there's those video of them. They're on like a German TV show. And they're just sort of, they're just playing the song live for this, for this TV program. And he has on that sort of pilgrim hat. Pilgrim hat. So like, yeah. So like a famous yeah. image of him. And I just remember seeing that and being like, wow. And that like main riff, it's like kind of like a twisted blues dome. But do do that, but do that, 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 you know, the way that that groove kicks in. And so that made a huge impression on me, his sound, his solo in that. And it just immediately was like, who is this? Okay, I've heard this guy, I've heard Smoke on the Water. I don't think I had any Deep Purple. I didn't have any Rainbow at that time. I was just floored and I was like, wow, you know, I just drawn to him visually and, and sonically. And years later, when YouTube came around, if you look, you can find they did like two other versions of this, two other takes of the song for that TV show. And one of them was used in the video that MTV would play and stuff like that. But if you see the two other takes, what's so interesting, we mentioned this about one of the things that we love about Richie's, they, they never played it the same. The three times they played it, it, was, it wasn't the, the, the intro was never even the same. You know, you see the other two versions, Richie plays, plays it differently. You know, yeah. and it just blows my mind that, and, and they're so casual about it. They're like, you know, he just sort of counted off and he just plays a different thing. And then he goes into the main riff and his solo is different in each one of them. And the way he plays the rhythm is different in each, there's subtle differences and major differences between all three of them. So just, just amazing that they're just able to, to do that i'm just fascinated by that so i had to put that as my first pick just because it was sort of my first time i saw richie and you know put put it together and the image and the sound and everything so that's my number living, bre living breathing thing that's what it is you know even my example there burn there will be small differences in how he actually punctuates the riff or you know small things like that and of course the band is not going to be thrown off because they are, they are also part of the same organism that lives and breathes. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, you're not going to, uh, I mean, as a, just as a person, you're not going to think, am I breathing the same way as I did yesterday? You're just breathing, breathing, you know. And that's how natural, I guess, uh, it can be if you're a really good, tight ensemble like uh, the Purple. And also Rainbow, of course, uh, which is more like, obviously, his band entirely. And uh, my, uh, it's my turn, right? I think. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> second pick would be uh, we're gonna head to the first Rainbow record then, and uh, with the Elf lineup, where he basically just conquered that band. You know, just okay, I'm gonna you're gonna be my band. And guitarist sadly went out. Now I can't recall his name, but that's largely because he didn't do anything after, and he was pretty good, the guy in Elf. But of course, you know, Richie was the biggest there was then, and so it's very clear that the band would hop onto that and. Uh, this uh, riff or melody, I guess you could say, is quite different to Burn, and it will be Temple of the King. So that's the little, you know, bam, ba ba di bam, ba dum bam, that thing, yeah, which yeah. I think is beautiful and it's a good example of more the lower dynamic Richie. It's very nice, smooth, you know, and also kind of storytelling already in its melody, yeah. I would say. And it has a little bit of that medieval Renaissance thing that he would revisit. Of course, where yeah. he is right now. Yeah, that's where he, he lives now, right? Right, exactly. For better or worse. Right. You know, and I'll say this about Blackmore's Night. Uh, yeah, would I love it if he was, you know, making albums like uh, Long Live Rock and Roll and stuff, of course. 
but I respect him for what he's doing because it's something that he wants to do. It's not some sort of, if, if he was just in it for the money, he would get back in Deep Purple. He would. Well, he already made Rainbow. Smoke and Water. You know, like John Lord said when he was alive, that song has been very kind to us. Yeah. So I mean, Richie's I mean, doing what he wants to do now, and you can sort of laugh at him for the outfits he wears and stuff like that. But from a guitar playing perspective, the stuff that he plays in Blackmore's Night, some of that stuff is is really challenging. Yeah. No, my, look, I totally get it. Because I look at some of those bands, like we talk about, like Maiden, Sabbath, uh, even Metallica, Megadeth. It's uh, it's a hard spot. They they've I don't know if they put themselves there, but they are in that spot of you know when they have to when they have to recreate what they did good yeah. last time. Uh, it's a tough place to be in. So I totally get rich. More like kind of okay. I've already did burn. I already did burn. I already did kill the king. Uh, so I'm gonna relax and do this feels yeah. good to me it feels natural so i i wouldn't i wouldn't badmouth uh, blackmore's nights or blackmore's night but okay am i as into it no not really i couldn't even phrase the name right just now so <laughs> you know that that tells but you know the i think if i was him i'd be happy yeah. i could put it like that you know yeah all right, my number nine is this. I'm going to go with, uh, I'll bring this one up now because you just mentioned it, but uh, Burn. I'm also going to say, though, not only for the main riff, I love the guitar solo section where he does that. Now, again, incorporating the main riff is a very bluesy type of riff. And then you have this like our fugue. It's like a fugue. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. It sounds like a Bach thing inserted in the middle there so yeah definitely burn one of his signature most recognizable riffs up, up there with smoke on the water and, and a couple others so that's number nine for me all right what's your next pick number eight next pick uh i'm gonna try and switch eras so next pick uh, also switch styles this one is different it's quite minimalist actually it's from uh, the jlt era uh, straight between the eyes and the song is uh, tearing tearing out my heart Nice. And the chorus riff is what I sort of hone in on. Down, bow, 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 bow. Yeah. Simple, right? It's kind of more Iomi, simple, really effective, really heavy. And I know you like a good ballad, so I guess you should like that song. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I mentioned that the first time I saw Richie was, uh, you know, that no, no, no clip. But then I got. Uh, this was right when my my dad had bought a VHS machine and this was I lived in a very rural in the middle of nowhere place and there was a local drugstore uh, that had a couple of VHS tapes like I'm talking like about 20 VHS tapes you know at, at the place to right. rent that you could rent and uh, for some insane reason, amongst like, you know, you know, I think they had like, I don't know, you know, some movies from the 70s, popular movie, The Godfather. And um, amongst that was the Live Between the Eyes VHS from that tour nice. from Straight Between the Eyes. And, and I got that and it was just floored. So my first exposure to Rainbow was to the through the Joe Lynn Turner era. So I made a video on my channel in defense of the Joe Lynn Turner era. And so I'm a big fan of all eras of Rainbow. But I'm for my next pick, I'm gonna go back to the first album here and I'm gonna go with Man on the Silver Mountain. The main riff in that is it's, it's the smoke on the water riff of the Rainbow. Thumper. Uh, band, yeah. you know, it's, it's the one that, young guitar players if, if they're going to tackle a rainbow riff they probably probably start with that one it's it's, it's very signature it's even so much so that even uh ronnie took that with him to the dio band and would play smoke on, or uh, uh man on the silver mountain man on the silver mountain you know f with his dio band you know pretty much yeah yeah he did have like it in hell like and such right too it's like he always sort of mixed eras a little bit uh, like his best off and that song is usually faster live also if i recall yeah. than on the record uh, i like it. i like it both ways you know some songs can't be too quick 
but some songs just work, you know, in in, yeah. in any shape. I think that's one of them, even though it's more of a thumper riff, you know. Yeah, and it's kind of a classic, you know, Richie picking out the two note riff the way he does, you know, it has like a snappy feel uh, to it the way he does that. So, yep, great riff, how to put it on here. It's sort of the smoke on the water of, of Rainbow, if you, riff of Rainbow. So. It is, right? It's G minor too, I think. Yeah, that's, that's Richie's key, water. G minor. Yeah, his favorite key, G minor, smoke on the water, burn as well. Uh, but uh, I guess then my next example shouldn't be in G minor, you know, just to stay, <laughs> just to stay with some, uh, some variation here. And I'm going to pick one that has to be mentioned. It's a pretty clear choice to me anyway. And it's uh, Light in the Black from obviously from the second Rainbow album, Rising. Uh, it's that riff. Uh, which I think has a lot of influence on latter metal you know, way into the 90s even. That pedal type riffing, lots of attack, lots of melody. You can find it in Metallica, or you could even go to Swedish more extreme metal like At The Gates or something, and they will have that type of riff. So I think that's a, deserves a mention for sure. Yeah. All right, well, I'm gonna stick with that album then since you mentioned that. And uh, I'm gonna say Stargazer, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention it for the solo. Hmm. Solo on this is one of my favorite Richie solos, or at least a top 10 Richie, top five Richie solo. There's a point in the solo. Well, first of all, Richie is very underrated for playing the slide oh, on yeah. the guitar, something that almost nobody does in this sort of heavy rock, metal, metal-ish context. And for those who don't know, slide is like a metal tube that you put over your finger and when you move it up and down the string it used mostly in, in blues but Richie used it in a heavy hard rock setting and there's a spot in his solo where he's climbing up the neck and he gets to this note and he bends it and he just keeps bending and bending and bending and every time I hear that it's like I'm right on the edge of my seat like and then he gets to it you know it's like he suspends it's like you're being suspended there waiting for this note to sort of reach the zenith, the top of the mountain, you know, or something. Yeah. And the way he builds that solo is just so, so fantastic, man. And then that note for me, when he gets up, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite notes in, from a guitar solo is that last note yeah, that, he gets yeah, that, yeah. that he, that note, or it's not the last note, but he gets to that note and he bends it up up really high like that. Just love it. Sends a shiver up my spine. So Stargazer, uh, you know, bonus shout out, of course, to the main riff of that song. And the song in general is amazing, but I'm going to, I'm going to listen solo as my, my moment. You, you gotta be good if, if, you know, if a listener picks up on a note, yeah <laughs> that's what you want to do you know you don't want to have this like incredibly complex lick that a few nerds get you want that note you know and that's part of him he calls it like searching and uh, i agree with that like he's playing with his ears a lot i yeah. can hear he's just not looking at which fret is on and okay that's good and you mentioned the slide of course that makes uh for anyone not playing guitar that sort of deletes the space in between notes it's all seamless when right. you're sliding so you really have to use your ears and uh, He's good at that, you know. Okay. Next pick. Yep, next pick. Next pick. Uh, then I'm going to go for um, actually another riff uh, and another JLT era rainbow riff, uh, Spotlight Kid. I think that's a cool sort of a quicker riff. And I mention it now because it's also, to me, a bit of a successor of uh, Light in the Black. as yeah. a similar type tempo and uh, maybe a song like I discovered JLT era quite late. So if you haven't discovered that, I think that's a good choice to, there's a lot of action tunes, you know, I could mention, uh, uh, what is it called? The uh, Back Alley Driver? Yeah. Death Alley Driver. Death Alley Driver. Yeah. yeah, those songs like that one in Spotlight Kid, you know, uh, to get some of that quick fix uh, from yeah. the JLT era. And it's, it's really good stuff. And it's still, you know, it's 80s, sure, but it's not uh, the, the artificial part of 80s. It still has that genuine uh, sort of analog, I guess, group. Yeah. Great pick and an awesome show opener. You know, they he used that for forever. Uh, yep. would play the over the rainbow theme and then they did go into spotlight kids. So yeah, fantastic. 
All right, well, I'm gonna jump back to uh, Deep Purple here and I'm gonna go to In Rock and uh, Deep Purple In Rock. I'm gonna go with Into the Fire, uh, that main riff to that bum, bum, ba, da, ga, ga, da, ga, ga, ga. Mm -hmm. I think it's just awesome, super heavy. Uh, you know, uh, Martin Popoff, the uh, metal author, and I agree with him on this. Sort of ground zero really for metal is uh, three albums. First Black Sabbath album, uh, Deep Purple and Rock, and Uriah Heep, very heavy, very humble. You know, those are kind of the, if you want to really trace it back. And uh, I just think that's one of the heavier riffs here on In Rock. So I always loved it. So I went with that. Good pick. I got my friend's dad's old copy of that vinyl here back in the shelf. And it's, uh, I was surprised on how mean it's, it is, you know, it's not only heavy, yeah. it's also kind of mean, distorted, uh, yeah. uh, almost, uh, I, I struggle to find the right uh, adjective for it, but it's almost a bit nasty in a way, you know, it's like, a, uh, yeah, which I makes that makes me go back to that album. And I think it's, you know, if you only had the first Black Sabbath, that's a different version of the origin of metal. Whereas this is, you know, a little bit more, it's almost more messy, even the way it starts with the Speed King. And they're just, you know, doing the sound check thing. Yeah. Everyone on full, you know, it's just like, who does that? And then going into good golly, Miss Molly. Yeah. The first lyric, you know, it's like, it's yeah. a unique band in many ways. Uh, I lost one. track of what number we're on. I think we're on seven, maybe, or six here. And we're just sort of randomly picking them off our... <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know what we're on, seven or six, because I'm jumping around on my list also. I, I lost it. Yeah, exactly. There's a bit ad hoc here, but there's a lot of good stuff to, to draw from anyway. So it's no struggle in that sense. Uh, I wanted to go back to the purple as well. And uh, I'm going to go with a big, big one here, but also I haven't picked any solo parts yet. So I'll go for the uh, Highway Star solo bit. Uh, there's a lot of Classic. signature licks in there. And those signature licks that Steve Morris would still do pretty much faithfully today when they play live because they are part of the song. And I guess that's what I want to focus in on. Uh, I'd l I like guitar solos that non-guitarists can dig. Yeah. I think that's musical. That's a cool thing. And, and this one, of course, is quite, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit virtuous in its ways, but it's also catchy, I would say. So, yeah. and that goes for the entire bit. And of course, the, you know, the, the trade-off with uh, with Lord is very important too, in this song. And you mentioned Burn before, which I think is a bit of a, you know, sequel to that, uh, the fugue part, the Bach part, if you will. Yeah. So uh, yeah, have to mention Highway yeah. Star, and also like the main riff is is cool too. But uh, I'm gonna mention the solo bit for that one. Nice, yeah, that almost made my list because you're right. That it's one of the few solos that Richie he'll play those little signature lines like da 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 do da 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 do ba da 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 you know, because it's like you almost have to, have to play it. All right, I am going here now back to Rainbow and the Down to Earth album, hmm. Down to Earth album. And uh, the song Eyes of the World, I always love this song, but I'm going with the riff right at the very end of the song. I love that riff that bum da da dum bum 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 bum. It's like so cool. And I'm almost like, man, they just saved that riff just for they could have written a whole song around oh. that and they just saved it for the end of the song, but it makes it sound so epic. And I could have also said the spot in the song where everything drops out and Richie's playing by himself there. And just the main, the main riff of the of it too, but but that ending there in the eyes of the bum 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 that is just awesome man love it it's pretty metal the rhythm you know yeah it, it, is. it is yeah massive you know bringer of war type rhythm i would call it you know yeah, dun, 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 dun. yeah good pick too okay yeah, where, sh where should we head from here though where should we head next um let's have a look here at the list I will go Rainbow again. I haven't mentioned Long Live Rock and Roll much, and I think Kill the King deserves a mention for sure. Uh, the main riff, how it kicks in, and oh, yeah. uh, also there's a bit in the solo that always caught me, which is a tiny bit of a sweep. He doesn't do that often, yeah. but there's a little. Yeah. I'm sure you know what I mean. Oh yeah. So I could actually, okay, I could actually pinpoint exactly that then, because there's something about it, you know, that is just it feels spontaneous doesn't feel show-offy 
but it's you know it's still also a, a stunt you know that, that fits that song is a high intensity high tempo song that's uh, very metal in many ways it's not that bluesy so, yeah and yeah. i love uh the the last verse of the song is 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 modulates they modulate after the solo so it's it's in a higher key than the than the earlier verses which i just think is just so creative and when dealing you know trees on trees i just think that's fantastic man and the way yeah. you know uh the riff that main riff is killer and the way it moves you know there's just all these moving chords in it but it's just awesome man what a good example also of his uh, uh collab with dio like there's so many vocal bits there, like devour, devour, and then like yeah. that stuff. You know, it's just yeah. like, who would have done that in those years? None but those guys, I would say. All right, well, I'm going to stay then with uh, Long Live Rock and Roll for my next pick. Uh, the main riff, The Gates of Babylon. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I like guitar players that incorporate classical sounds and especially that scale. I forget what the name is. It's like Phrygian for you guitar players. Phrygian dominant. I would, yeah, Phrygian yes. dominant Venture scale. Get. Like I, Uli Roth plays yeah. around with that in Sales of Sharon. I was always loved the sound of that, that scale. And, and this is, you know, big, you know, hearing this and just that sort of Middle Eastern vibe to the to the scale and the way he plays it, I just think that riff is just absolutely killer. Could have went with the guitar solo in it too. The way the keyboards come in and that and all those chord changes, it's just so dramatic. It's just so well written. It's so amazing. But that main riff because it because it you know got me hooked on that sort of Phrygian dominant sound that Uli would use yeah, in the would make song. a career out of. So. Yeah, it's are you ships song. are burned you know that main riff and in bass are you ships are, now now your ships are burned it has that same type of type of sound to it which is just love it so all right that's my that's my pick there what Great do you got next my, well, actually my friends in the uh, swedish sort of doom tried heavy metal band sorcerer uh, recently made a cover of uh, gates of babylon as well which oh, wow. is, uh, i recommend they did it well you know it's uh, big shoes to step into uh, and, and I had a pick also, I think it's that solo, uh, but uh, you know, I'm not playing it back now, but I think that's where you get a bit of a snake charmer slide mm -hmm. happening. Yeah. So that was actually my next pick would have been that one because I had to pick one of those, you know, he's got plenty of those snake charmer. Yeah. So it could really be any of those, but I have to mention it. So let's call it snake charmer, Richie okay. in any song, you know, that would be my next pick. Awesome. I love it. Okay, I'm going to go back to Deep Purple. I'm not even sure if Richie came up with this riff or if it was John Lord. So the song Perfect Strangers, the main riff in it is killer, but I love that odd meter part that do da 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 so I went with that riff there in the middle of uh, the song Perfect Strangers. Cool one. And I know that when, when Lord had quit the band, but he was still alive, uh, he would appear doing this song, even though they had Don Ari already on the keys, he would appear, appear yeah. out of the smoke, you know, and, and play uh, Start Off uh, Perfect Strangers, yeah. the, the title track. song, man, so great. Yeah, we're syncing up too, because my next pick is from the same record. Okay. Uh, it's uh, Knocking at Your Back Door that main that that main riff melody yeah. also that could be lord i'm not sure but uh, it's a it's a killer riff awesome all right i think we're getting i'm almost i think we to our top two yeah, right to our top two i got two left on my list so i've got we mentioned this a little earlier uh from straight between the eyes uh death alley driver i'm gonna say mm -hmm. the guitar solo in this one because he starts it off with like this Beethoven theme. And then when the whole thing kicks in and he does that sweet piggy, and he just sort of, you know, he goes crazy. It's just fantastic. Love it, man. Love it. He When he just cuts loose like that, it's like he's in control during the, and then he just like, lets it fly and his his solo sound the sound his guitar sound in the solo is just so cool so fantastic love it 
for right. people who'd say like think of like the Joe Lynn Turner era, oh, it's like foreign or or something, you know. That's it's what like, I thought too, right? When I was younger. Uh, I mean, when you dig deeper, you know, yeah, there's moments like that, but you know, you do have things like Death Alley Driver, Eyes on Fire, uh, yeah. tearing out my heart. You know, there are some some heavy moments. Uh, you know, I mean, let's put it like this: it's not AOR, right? Not really. You know, maybe flavors of it. You know, since you've been gone or something like that. But even that is a pretty good hit song, I would say. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. My next. So yeah, I think this might be your last pick, right? All right, this could be the last. Uh, that would work because I had one more thing that I wanted to address, and that's Funky Richie. You know, because famously he didn't like being Funky Richie. Uh, you know, he quit Deep Purple because he didn't <laughs> like that music uh, or the direction, rather. And then Glenn Hughes uh, commented, like, "No, no, no, Richie is a damn funky player," uh, and it's true. Uh, so that's my last pick is going to be um, "Sail Away" from Burn. So right back where we started. And you know, it's super funky, you know, and uh, who couldn't, you know, who wouldn't bob their head when that comes in? Yeah. Love that riff. Uh, and also, you know, again, a different style. Yeah, for sure. So I think yeah, that's a good one that. to finish on. Yeah. yeah, he was able to play that that kind of uh, sound very convincingly. He's a, he's a very rhythmic player. Yep. You know, he's not a, uh, even with when he plays just the hard rock. The heavier stuff there's this rhythmic element to, to what he does okay my last pick and i picked this one deliberately saved it for last because it's a favorite blackmore moment and it you know it it, it shows what what i probably love most uh, uh, about richie his melodicism his uh his the way he can play very very emotional this this example is there's nothing technical really about this song, but it's just, just it's so beautiful. It's so melodic and it's uh, from Difficult to Cure, Maybe Next Time. It has that German, German name there in the front, uh, but it's just a beautiful ballad and that he soloing over that instrumental thing. It, there's, there's no crazy chops in it or anything. But it's just so beautiful. It's so melodic. Richie's vibrato, Richie's choice of notes. Uh, it can bring a tear to my eye if I'm, you know, in, For sure. in, the, in the right mood. And that's uh, if, what I love uh, about him the most, that he can, it, it's such a beautiful, well-crafted, melodic. There, there isn't a note in it that you mentioned earlier that you can tell that Richie plays by ear. There is, and I would say the same thing for Michael Shanker. They're both guitar players that it never sounds like they're just playing notes like, okay, I'm my hands in this position. I'm just going to, it never sounds like that, you know, and this is so exposed. It's so open. It's yeah. so that the, the music behind it is very relaxed. And if those who haven't heard of this is very mellow sort of spacey ballad. And he's just starts off playing slide goes to his fingers <clears throat> and it's so open it's so exposed but his touch his feel his vibrato the way he hangs on on the notes and everything clapped in like you know with just making every single note count it never feels like in that song like he's just lost or he's just playing something just for the sake of playing it you know it's like just melody just sort of pouring out of him so Definitely yeah, it's good stuff. Like, a, a ballad had to be mentioned. I think we went a little low on the ballads uh, there. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'll shout out two honorable mentions that I, you know, have to mention quickly. One is that uh, you mentioned already, so that's why I kept it. It was uh, Catch the Rainbow, and especially on uh, on the live one from Germany, uh, what, on stage, right? Yeah. yeah. It was my first Rainbow Vinyl, and that side, you know, knocks me out. It's a complete side, that song. And the little chamber stuff he plays, it's almost yeah. like he's, he's so cool like yeah, he doesn't yeah. register that there's a crowd there it's almost like oh, oh i didn't see you there or he's just fiddling around you know yeah and uh, and the other mention will be a muscle riff that i realized i have to mention it's uh, also deep purple but a bit later i think 1990 uh, slaves and masters uh, cut runs deep yeah. has sort yeah. of a headfield riff that comes in and that's a different touch to it and a very cool you know super muscular driving engine type riff uh, so i think you know just to encapsulate all the styles he had 
that would be the last two honorable mentions. Yeah. And of course, there are more, but I think we did okay here. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. Uh, our 10 favorite uh, Richie Blackmore moments. I, I think it's pretty clear from this video that we're both fans of Richie Blackmore. Uh, so let us know in the comments down below what you thought of our picks. Let us know some of your favorite Richie Blackmore riffs, licks, solos, whatever. Put them, put them in the comments down below. I'd like to thank Jonathan for joining me here. I hope hopefully you'll be able to come back to the lair. We'll do some other videos. Make sure you check out his podcasts and I will be leaving links below in the description for his podcast for Maiden A to Z where uh, he and him and his co-host go through the Maiden alphabet, all the songs in alphabetic order, usually two songs per episode. Right. We started like that, but now it's harder and harder to squeeze in two songs. It ends up being often one. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm actually doing uh, some themed episodes now because I need a break from the intenary. So the next one up is going to be with a guy you might know, Henrik. Yeah. Yep. It's Henrik. on a special theme. A yeah, he was, Henrik's been here at the Lair. He did our uh, hidden progressive rock gems uh, episodes. So yeah, that's a fan. I know he's a big Maiden fan. Him and Matthias, Matthias has been here at the Lair. They have, and I've mentioned this, they have a uh, Maiden's, Iron Maiden in Stockholm uh, video that they do showing all the places that Maiden played in Stockholm. So, okay, the Megadeth podcast, so far, so pod, uh, so, so what? So what? Yeah, you got okay, it, you what's, got it. What's the format like for, for that podcast? It's a little punkier, you know, which, which goes with the title. So we switch formats, but we are very involved with the listeners and asking them if they liked it or not. So we know what to return to, because otherwise, you know, we could just talk. We wouldn't have to record it. So obviously we're doing that and we just started. And so far we did a, a thorough listening through and uh, analysis of the first record. Killing is my business and business is good. Uh, we did an introduction of ourselves and now just recently a new single popped. So we made last episode was uh, a thorough analysis of that when there's one coming in this friday i'm not sure when this is aired but uh, this friday as we're recording where we have uh, we're do uh, we're doing that song again but with guests so i called a few guests and uh, you know gathered some audio commentary on that and uh, where we will go next that's a secret that that show you know has a uh, i guess from doing the alphabet thing with uh, made need to see it's nice to do something where we can uh, move freely around in the entire discography really or, or mythology of the band and the, I, i've got a co-host closer to you he's in buffalo so that would be buffalo greg or greg the pasquale or the true greg at if you will you know awesome so, all right sounds fantastic all. Yeah. all right well there'll be links in the uh description down below there so you can check out those check out those podcasts so all right i'd like to thank jonathan again and uh thanks everybody out there make sure you hit like and subscribe and until we see you again make sure you stay heavy stay metal stay heavy